Joe Rochford. I'm the director of the uh, Integrated Program in Neuroscience here at McGill. Uh, the person to my right who was speaking, who you can partially, uh, is uh, Debisha. And I can never pronounce her name properly, so I'm not even going to try to attempt it because I always uh, murder it. Um, and to our left, we have two of. Um, who are both um, sort of um, officers of our graduate student association, and they will have um, some very valuable information to share with you as we go through. Okay, so um, as many of you probably are aware, because you're interested in pursuing graduate studies uh, in the field, uh, neuroscience is encompasses a whole variety of different uh, disciplines and domains. And one of the things we're proud uh, about here in the IPN is that we are equally broad and we cover all sort of disciplines. As the next slide shows, excuse me, shows, um, we, um, um, We're very interdisciplinary, and our program covers um, a whole variety of, you know, all possible areas of neuroscience, going from um, sort of the most molecular, genetic, all the way up to systems. Uh, we also have uh, sort of um, supervisors who can do sort of uh, clinical work uh, in neuroscience areas. I do want to mention that we do not offer a clinical degree. So if you come out uh, with a degree in our program, uh, it does not mean that you will be a practicing uh, professional, either a, a doctor or a lawyer or, an, or any other uh, sort of uh, health profession. Um, the IPN is really uh, distinct from most other programs in that it's kind of an umbrella program that covers um, um, all departments that do any kind of work in neuroscience. So we have faculty members from uh, cell and molecular biology. We have faculty members from psychology, uh, physiology. We have some occupational therapists in our group. We have some, um, we even have one or two philosophers, <laughs> interestingly enough. So we really cover the entire sort of um, domain of neuroscience in its most broad definition. And so we're a very, very vast network um, of, uh, of investigators uh, now. And of course, we cover all kinds of topics. So we have people who are interested in sort of neuroimmunology, neurodegenerative disorders, music and language. We have a, a very strong um, a uh, group of, of people who are, who are looking at that. Uh, systems neuroscience, we have a whole variety of, of people who are doing neuroimaging, uh, either in terms of developing new uh, imaging pipelines or techniques or applying those for, to particular populations to investigate what happens to the brain as a function of uh, uh, patient status. We also have a, a number of people who are doing um, sort of neuroimaging of small animals, so animal models of pathology. Uh, we have two groups that can um, image uh, those animals. Uh, you know, neuroengineering, cellular molecular, we're there. And as uh, I mentioned, uh, our program covers not just um, one particular place. Um, so although the office is based at the Montreal Neurological Institute, uh, we have a variety of different people spanning uh, different departments at McGill, but we also have um, uh, affiliated McGill hospitals who are doing neuroscience research. So uh, I personally am based at a hospital here in Montreal called the Douglas Hospital, which is one of the major, um, one of two major psychiatric hospitals uh, in, in the Montreal area. Uh, we have the uh, another um, place called the Institut de Recherche Clinique de Montréal that does a whole variety of different um, clinical neuroscience, um, uh, runs a variety of clinical neuroscience programs, et cetera, et cetera. So effectively, the point I'm trying to make here in my offhand, uh, very tangential way is 
no matter what branch of neuroscience you're interested in pursuing or what kind of a topic in neuroscience you're interested in pursuing, we more than likely have people who, um, who can supervise you, uh, supervise you on, on that particular uh, topic. Okay. Now, in terms of the uh, program and its structure, um, so whether you're a master's student or a PhD student in our program, we have two, uh, three sort of core courses, the required courses. The first one is uh, called Principles of Neuroscience One, which is effectively an overview of all cellular and molecular neuroscience. We have Principles of Neuroscience Two, which is more systems oriented, so going above the neuron to um, networks and projections and um, and actual systems. Um, and last but not least, we have a course which is called Responsible Conduct and Research, which is really just a, a two-session course that, in, that deals with all of the ethical issues uh, revolving around um, conducting research in a, a, an ethical and responsible manner. So we cover topics such as um, authorship, uh, plagiarism, um, uh, data ownership, um, ethics with human and, and animal uh, research subjects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, those are all courses that, <clears throat> again, are mandatory, although it, the mandatoriness depends upon whether you're coming in as an MSc student or as a PhD student, as the next um, slide will likely indicate. Okay. Um, in addition to our core courses, there, of course, we have a variety of elective courses uh, that can be chosen from within either the IPN or various other departments in McGill that, again, span all of the departments, biology, biomedical engineering, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, if you are a master's student, the course load is three courses. And now, in terms of fulfilling the course requirements, you have different options here. You can either take uh, PN1 and PN2 and then one elective course. Alternatively, you can take one of the um, core courses, uh, so either PN1 or PN2, and then you can take two electives. Okay. That's really up to you. That's something that, um, that you will negotiate with your supervisor. Um, uh, but either of those, uh, any of those three options is clearly um, an alternative. Now, the other thing I should mention is that if you've already taken a lot of um, prior courses in either molecular or systems neuroscience or both, you can apply for an exemption to the core courses. That is, you send us the syllabus of, or syllabi of the courses that you've taken and saying, look, I think this material in this course that I've already taken as an undergraduate or as a master's student covers the material that's in uh, PN1 or PN2 or both, and I'd like to get a, an exemption. We will look at that, and if in fact there is a substantial overlap between uh, the content of the courses that you've already taken and our courses, then effectively we'll, we will give you an exemption and you do not have to take um, either of uh, 630 or 631. Okay. Um, now, that being said, this is a course exemption. It is not a course credit. Okay. So it means that you still need to take, as a master's student, three courses. What it means, effectively, is that if you get an exemption for 630 and 631, um, then, effectively, you're free to take three of the elective courses. So just to let you know that this, is, this, this doesn't mean that your, an exemption will reduce the workload of your courses, but rather it just will free you up a little bit in terms of taking courses that you may be more interested in taking because it's more relevant to your, um, to your thesis project or it might be re relevant to a particular interest that you have and that you'll be open more, it'll be, there'll be more flexibility in terms of, of um, taking those courses. Next. Ah, okay. Now, um, 
For a PhD, the course load consists of four courses. Again, for a PhD, you have to take either 630 or 631, and then you can take two electives. Although again, if you apply for exemptions for either 630 or 631, then you are free to take four elective courses. Okay. Now, both our MSc and our PhD programs are thesis-based. A master's thesis consists of, um, the, the criteria for a master's thesis, a successful master's thesis at McGill are really just the following, that you're able to identify a question that needs answering, you are familiar with the literature that has looked at that particular issue. You're able to come up with a couple of experiments or do a, a project that addresses that issue. You're able to, um, to analyze those data appropriately, interpret them appropriately, and make the appropriate conclusions. So you'll notice that there's nothing in there that says that your MSc thesis needs to be something that is um, sort of publishable or uh, new knowledge. It just need, it really the MSc thesis is there just to show you're capable of effectively conducting research in a neuroscientific domain. Okay. For a PhD thesis, it's very different. Okay. For a PhD thesis, the thesis must show or be able to demonstrate uh, what we refer to as advancement of knowledge. That is, you need to be able in your thesis to say, this is what I found in my thesis that was not known previously, that is a new bit of information that adds to the uh, neuroscientific database and makes a contrib contribution to the advancement of the field. Okay. Okay. Now, in terms of a timeline, okay, um, for the MSc thesis, Normally, we yeah, like students to, um, to complete their MSc no, thesis in yeah. two years, uh, but you have a maximum of three years to do so. For a PhD thesis, um, typically our PhD students graduate yeah. about four to five to five and a half years, I believe the last time we checked the average um, graduation time was four and a half years. You have a maximum of seven years to complete your PhD thesis. If you have not done so within seven years, then McGill will withdraw you from the program. Although in that case, it just means that you're not allowed to do any more research. If you have enough data to write up your thesis, then you can continue to write your thesis. And when you're ready to submit and defend, you simply apply for readmission. We admit you for that uh, semester. You submit your thesis, it gets evaluated, you defend it, and if you defend it successfully, then you have obtained your PhD. Okay. Now, the last thing I would just wanna mention here is again to reiterate that um, there is no exemption for the responsible conduct and research course, that is NUR 705. Everyone needs to take NUR 705. Okay. So there's no exemption for that. Even if you've taken previous courses that deal with research ethics, you are still required to take it while you're here at McGill. Just to make that clear. Okay. Um, we do offer a rotation program uh, for select applicants. Um, and so effectively that means that we will accept anywhere between six to seven uh, new students every fall semester. And the advantage of the rotations uh, program is that in your first year uh, uh, in the PhD program, you will um, be allowed to sort of rotate through three different labs for a three to four month period. And that allows you to sample um, the different labs, the work that they're doing. It allows you to identify uh, perhaps topics or uh, refine exactly what your interests are and match those interests with the particular lab that you're in. And that after the rotation is done, you typically will join one of the three rotation labs and complete your PhD, uh, starting in year two of the rotation program. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, I'm gonna pass the buck here and uh, for admissions to Sure. 
how you do the application process. Okay. okay. Mia culpa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, what will it take for you uh, to get admitted uh, either as an MSc applicant or as a PhD applicant? Okay, so first of all, for the MSc, you need an undergraduate degree um, uh, from a recognized institution. Uh, that typically is any recognized university throughout the world. Um, you need to have a minimum 3.3 uh, a cumulative grade point average out of four. Uh, the 3.3 out of four is the McGill uh, GPA average. A 3.3 typically um, corresponds to, I believe it's a B plus, something along those lines. So if you've got a 3.3 or higher, of course, um, that meets the criterion. Um, it's to your advantage to have some kind of prior background in the biological sciences, not necessarily in neuroscience per se, but effectively that you um, have some background in sort of the, the life sciences or biological sciences that have to do with the central nervous system, uh, whether that's in psychology or physiology, excuse me, um, or pharmacology, that's fine, but, um, but uh, it's to your advantage to do that. If you've got a background in sort of the arts, um, so if you've got a bachelor's degree in um, history, um, that's probably not going to cut it. Okay? And that's to your advantage because effectively, uh, you know, we, we kind of throw you right into the program. And if you don't have the necessary preparation, you're not going to do all that well. Okay? So uh, that's the reason why we, we sort of do that. Um, if you have sort of advanced level coursework um, from your university, that's the third or fourth year undergraduate level courses in the neuroscience, that's probably even better. Um, if you have some prior research experience in a lab, that's also uh, preferable, not necessarily because it will uh, sort of determine whether or not you are admitted into the program, but rather in large part because if you've got laboratory experience, that will make it a lot easier for you to find a, or get you interested uh, in a supervisor, um, a biased supervisor in your application. Uh, and so that's important because the last sort of uh, thing that we need in order to be admitted is, of course, Confirmation from a McGill supervisor saying, yes, I'm going to take this student into my lab as a master's student. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit in terms of how to go about finding a supervisor. But the point I'm trying to make right now is that uh, if you've already done work in a research lab that is sort of in the same line or in the same discipline as one or more McGill supervisors, that will make them much more interested in your application because effectively they're coming in going, hey, this person's already kind of has an idea of, of what to do in my lab, um, has some experience with doing that. It's probably picked up some of the techniques that I use in my lab and so therefore my uh, training of this particular student will go that much more rapidly. Um, if you're coming in as a PhD, again, you need a master's level um, degree from a recognized university. The GPA standards are still the same, so a cumulative GPA of 3.3. I should mention that this 3.3 GPA for PhD applicants applies to both your undergraduate and your master's um, uh, training. Okay? <clears throat> you also need, again, pertinent research experience. Hopefully, you are in a master's program that uh, has a thesis uh, requirement or at least has a strong sort of research uh, component and requirements for that. Um, and so you should, again, be familiar with the field of research that you wish to study in. Uh, and effectively, this is really just a question of, you know, matching your interests and your expertise with the interests and expertise uh, of the uh, IPN supervisors. Okay? And again, that will help with you, uh, help you in terms of confirming and recruiting uh, a supervisor who will in fact take you in. Okay. Um, okay. 
Um, for the rotation program, okay. Um, again, it's pretty much the same, except that now for the rotation program, we sort of up the um, requirements with respect to the GPA. So you need a 3.7 GPA or higher uh, on a McGill level. And a 3.7 GPA um, corresponds to uh, an A or an A minus um, um, in most universities. Okay. And again, research experience. Uh, and if you've got some kind of publication record um, or, or something that distinguishes your undergraduate career or your master's career um, uh, relative to someone else, that will, of course, increase your chances of, of getting into the rotation program. And by publication, I do not necessarily mean a, a journal article, uh, but a publication could consist of, for example, um, uh, um, uh, an abstract or a poster that you presented at a, at a major conference. Uh, these are the sorts of things that we'll look at and we'll go, oh, you know, this student looks really, really um, well prepared to join our rotation program because they've, you know, they'll be able to profit from the rotation um, very, very readily. Um, I want to thank Debisha for doing this. She actually spent the last little bit um, coming in uh, or preparing these statistics. So as of um, the incoming class in fall 2019, we have 112 new uh, recruits. 52% uh, of those uh, came in as masters and of course 48% applied as PhD. Um, 57% have been uh, female applicants, which is quite interesting. When I got into this line of work, um, there were relatively few females who uh, were coming into neuroscience. And over the years, I've noticed how going to different conferences, the sort of population uh, attending the conferences has, has really shifted from sort of predominantly male to now it's getting to the point where it's you know majority female. So I'm very, very pleased about that. Um, and uh, our applicants have come in by uh, with uh, from more than 25 different countries throughout the world okay? and the average C CGPA of our, our admittances are about 3.73 on the McGill scale but again if you don't have a 3.7 GPA do not necessarily think that that is a death uh, that is the death uh, knell of your application as long as you're a 3.3 or higher then effectively uh, you have a fairly decent chance of getting in, assuming that you can recruit uh, a supervisor. That really is the um, case. Now I think it's time for me to pass the buck to uh, Adisha. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll just quickly go over the application process, uh, specifically the online application form. I do want to mention that there will be a slide near the end of this presentation with uh, important web links, particularly for you guys. So um, be sure to take a screenshot of that slide or a picture of that slide when we get to that point. So I'm going to quickly go to the software that McGill uses uh, to submit our online applications, and that's called You Apply, basically. So You Apply is where you'll be submitting your online application form. If you are a new user to You Apply, you need to create a new account. So you can see here the web link to create a new account. Um, you fill in all the information. You'll be then provided with a username and password, which you will then use to log into you apply and submit your application. So I already have an account, so I'm already in it. Now, the first step is you need to complete your profile before you submit your application for IPM. So the profile, it consists of four components. There's the identification, contact information, additional information, and education history. Everything is pretty straightforward. I do want to mention a few important points for the education history component. Okay, so in education history, you have to include all of the details of all 
colleges and university level schools that you attended um, and which counted towards degrees and credits. So specifically, you need to enter the names of the institutions, the programs. So for example, if you did neuroscience or if you did computer science, you would enter the names of those programs. And you also have to enter the dates of when you attended and when you graduated as well. And the information that you enter on the online form needs to match the information appearing on your transcripts. If there's a discrepancy, it's going to cause delays in processing your application. So be sure that all of the details match your official documents. Another important point is you need to include information or you basically need to include entries in your education history for extra courses or any exchange semesters that you did and which counted towards your degree or added credits towards your degree as well. So you need to include all information accurately and uh, concisely as well. So once you complete your profile, then you can submit an application to the IPN. So you go under the My Application and you click New Application. So for IPN, we're considered a degree certificate or diploma. And throughout every stage of the online application form, you need to save. Otherwise, your entries will get lost and you won't be able to proceed to the next section of your online application form. All 2020. And then department, we, although we're called integrated program in neuroscience, we're actually going under N, neuroscience. So we find that there. Program, master's or PhD, let's go with master's. And then the area of study will be a neuroscience thesis. And it's a full-time program. So we're going to click save so that our entry gets saved and we're on to the next section. The second section, it's asking if you are considering applying for any funding. So for example, NSERC or CIHR, et cetera, or if you're not going to be applying for any funding, that's the last option here. So let's just pretend I'm applying for NSERC. Okay. Add something here is that all of these uh, listed um, options are not open for international students. Okay, or, or non-Canadian or Quebec students, except for the Vanier um, uh, scholarship. That's a possibility uh, if, you're, if you're a citizen of a different country. And of course, other fellowships or scholarships that may be applicable to your particular case. And then the other area you would basically tick off um, areas of neuroscience that you're interested in pursuing your project here. So let's say I'm interested in cognitive. So again, save and we go to the next section. So here you would enter the information of two referees, which is a requirement for our application process. They can be academic or professional references. So you would insert the name of your referee, and you would put the title or position, their employer, and also the email address, which is very important. Your referees will then receive an email at this address that you're providing, and they will upload their reference letters on your behalf. So they will automatically be contacted for this. And then you would describe how this referee knows you. So let's pretend they were a professor during And then you would basically do the same thing for your second referee as well. They need to be different referees and different email addresses as well. Uh, we encourage you to provide the um, official email addresses belonging to their institution. So let's say if they're a professor, um, use their the institution email address rather than let's say a personal account like Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo, et cetera. I'm just making up information here as we go. Okay, then we're clicking save. And then you click continue. So that's basically the basic component of your online application form. So 
in order for you to be able to upload, let's say your, all of your other supporting documents, like your CV, your personal statement, your unofficial transcripts, and your proof of English proficiency is if applicable, you need to submit that online application form and pay the application fee in order to be able to upload all of these documents. You won't be able to upload your documents if you don't submit and pay the fee for application. So, uh, like we said, these are the supporting documents, basically. Here, we need personal statement, we need CV, proof of English proficiency, and unofficial transcripts from all the university level institution that you have attended or are attending, and also any uh, extra courses or exchange semesters that added credits towards your degree. Now, if your unofficial transcripts are in a language other than English or French, they need to be accompanied by a translated version provided by the institution which issued your transcript or by a certified translator. One more point here is that if you've not completed your degree right now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't apply for the fall. It just means effectively that you will have need to completed your degree by the fall when you enter McGill. So what you would do in this case is submit your current transcript. And then if you do get admitted, when the time comes, McGill will contact you and say, okay, send us your latest transcripts that show that you've graduated either with an undergraduate or a, an MSc degree. And then everything will be fine. So you don't have to wait in order to complete your undergraduate or your master's degree. You can apply now with the understanding that you will be done by the fall. Yeah. Two other points that I want to, or one other point that I want to mention is in the section where it says, you know, what area of neuroscience are you interested in? It really isn't to your advantage to click off all of them. Okay. Because when a supervisor sees that, they're going to look at this and go, Oh, this is somebody who doesn't really care about my research. They just want to get into a graduate program in neuroscience. And no matter what they're interested in, um, you know, they're going to they're gonna come in. As opposed to if you click off something saying, like, I'm interested in behavioral neuroscience, um, then I, that's what I do. Okay, I look at that and go, oh, all right, this is somebody who really has an interest in what I'm doing. And so I'm going to go and look at, at his or her application. Um, it really doesn't help to just sort of say, you know, my interests are super varied here um, and I'm interested in all areas of neuroscience. It, it really doesn't. Okay, sorry, Alicia. back to you. Um, so other than uploading the documents after you submit your online application form, there will also be several additional questions that you will need to answer. So for example, it'll ask you, are you applying to the rotation program? And have you secured a supervisor? Now we'll go into this a bit uh, more into depth a bit later, but if you're uh, submitted your online application form without knowing who your supervisor is, you just have to answer that question as looking for one. Don't leave that field blank because otherwise your application may be considered as incomplete and it'll cause more delays as well. So if you don't have a supervisor yet when submitting your online application form, just reply saying looking for one. So that's pretty much the application process. And now I'll give it back to Dr. Rochford to talk about securing a supervisor. That the is true. Yes. Feel free to jump in with anything that I might. Uh, uh, um, okay, I just want to and add one more point is that the other thing that's really important about the application process is the personal statement. So the personal statement in your personal statement, what you want to do is put in there and say, look, I'm interested in this particular topic in neuroscience or this particular branch of neuroscience, and these are the reasons why as opposed to, I'm just interested in neuroscience. I've always had a passion, you know, I, I wish I had a dollar for every sentence time I've read a sentence that said, I'm fascinated by the brain. So I want to do something related to that. Um, Cause I wouldn't be here. I'd be sort of retiring on a beach in, in the Caribbean right now. Um, it, it really doesn't help. Okay. So 
really, when you're approaching a supervisor, you want to know what that supervisor does. It's usually a good idea to um, have read some of his or her research work and so that you know exactly what they're doing and that you can show them that what they're doing is interest, interesting to what you want to do or that you have similar interests, okay? <clears throat> now, if you're unsure, because uh, we, have, we have over 250 potential supervisors in the IPM, we do have a, a database, okay, and there's the link to that. Um, you can browse through the entire database to identify supervisors, and they give a brief synopsis of what it is that their main interests are. Okay. Uh, once you've identified X number of professors who are of interest to you, then feel free to contact them either by email or you can give them a call, although usually email is a little bit more uh, effective. Um, uh, your email should be short and concise. Say, look, Dr. So-and-so, uh, I'm applying to the IPN. I'm interested in pursuing research in this particular field. I see, I've read that you are doing work in this. Uh, could we communicate to determine whether or not um, uh, there could be a fit here and whether or not you're going to be um, able to take on a new graduate student? Um, indicate to the supervisor that your file can be found or will soon be able to be found on the IPN database. Um, it's a good idea to attach your CV, even though your CV may be in the application. It's a good idea to put that in the email so that, you know, professors are very busy people. Uh, they might look at this and say, okay, I have to go into the database and download this. And if it's in the email, they just click on the attachment and boom, they see it, they can look through it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, again, you want to be as specific as possible for why you think you would be an asset to their lab, okay, or why your interests mesh with their interests, um, and sort of indicate to them why you want to sort of join their particular lab. <coughs> you may not get an email immediately, uh, an email response immediately. Uh, in that case, again, supervisors are busy. They may be at conferences. They may be, have other things to do. They may be at granting agencies, reviewing grants, et cetera, et cetera. You may have just caught them at a very particularly busy time where they don't necessarily have the time to respond to all of their emails. I can also attest to you that um, email is a wonderful thing, except that like, I probably get 150 emails a day, right? And so if I can look through them all, I will, but very often I don't have the time to do that because uh, it's just, uh, there's only 24 hours in a day. So if you don't get a response, it's perfectly legitimate for you after a week or two of sort of your email sitting there without a response to send a reminder email saying, please, you know, this is a friendly reminder. Uh, I'm just wondering if you may have had the time to sort of look at, at my previous email. And if so, um, whether or not you know you would be interested in pursuing it, be polite. Uh, don't be aggressive. Don't be assertive. But uh, effectively, it's perfectly fine for you to do that. Okay. Um, if you don't get a response after two or three of these things, then it's pretty clear that the supervisor isn't interested or doesn't have the time, and therefore probably give up on that. That's why it's probably a good idea to, to identify three or four people who, um, who you uh, would consider working with. The other thing, again, I can't emphasize enough of how specific it needs to be. Okay? So I get tons of emails from students who have a very strong and impressive background in molecular neuroscience, for example, and they say, I'd like to join your lab. And I look at their CVs and they really are outstanding candidates, but I reply to them and say, look, I don't do molecular neuroscience. I do behavioral pharmacology. So effectively, uh, I can't help you with anything and you can't help me with anything. Therefore, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I can't sort of take you in. So that's really why it, it, it's really like, you know, uh, creating a fit between you, your intellectual interests 
and the intellectual or research uh, themes of the lab. That's what you want to get in your emails, in your personal statements, um, and again, when you fill out that little section about you know what your interests are. If there's a, if you're in a situation where you have uh, contacted and supervisors and more than one supervisor has gotten back to you, then it would be it would be a good idea to also get in touch with the lab members and like get see how you feel about the lab. Then trust your gut feeling and then make a decision. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Learning styles. Okay. So very often uh, we get students coming to us going, you know, I, I joined this lab and the problem is, is that, you know, my supervisor doesn't supervise me, right? And so then, we, then we'll approach the supervisor and say, well, no, I supervise, but I give my students a lot of independence. I ask them to come up with, you know, their own ideas or their own innovative things, which is perfectly legitimate. Some students want more supervision. Okay. Other students come and complain to us going, my supervisor is looking over my shoulder all the time and it just drives me crazy and I can't stand it. I like to work more independently. And so we look at that and go, well, is your supervisor insulting you or is he abusing you in any other way? And they go, no, he's just there looking at me all the time and telling me what to do. And I want to do it on my own. Okay. And so again, it's the fit between the supervisory style and the stu student's learning needs. So that's why it's really a good idea to talk with students who are in the lab to get an idea of um, how the lab is run. Because both supervisory styles are perfectly legitimate. You're saying that you Okay. Um, for securing a supervisor, one question that we get asked a lot is if you have to have a supervisor in order to submit your online application form. And the answer is no. In fact, we encourage you to submit an application to the IPN even if you have yet to secure a supervisor because all completed applications will be uploaded onto our internal database and our PIs are constantly scouting through this database and they may land upon your file and they may really like your file and they may contact you themselves. So it actually increases your chances of being matched or being found by a supervisor if you submit your application to the IPN. So if you don't have a supervisor yet, but you're interested in studying in the program, submit your application and then continue your search uh, for finding a supervisor. There that I'd like to add is that, you know, we, in the admissions office are looking at your application and we're going, oh, this person's got a really strong background, <coughs> excuse me, in this particular field and area. And we know that this supervisor is doing pretty much the same thing. So that might be a really good fit. So mm -hmm. we'll actually approach that individual supervisor and say, have a look at this applicant. Um, I, I think this applicant will be of interest to you. Um, and so effectively, we, we kind of try and work as a sort of match.com <laughs> sort of thing here um, for applications so that we get students and supervisors who look like they'd be a good match to sort of at least be aware of each other. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay, after you submit your application, okay, so what'll happen is, first thing that we'll do is we will check your transcripts to make sure that you meet the minimum GPA requirements. If you do meet the minimum GPA requirements and any other requirements that we might have that I can't think of right now. <coughs> yeah, that's right. So your, doc, your application is complete, you meet the minimum uh, GPA requirements, then what we do is we take your application, we put it on, an internal database uh, that's accessible to all of the IPN supervisors. Uh, we periodically send out emails to all the IPN supervisors saying, look, we've got a bunch of new applicants. 
on the internal database who are really good looking. Um, and so you might, if you're looking to take on a new graduate student, um, you might want to have a look uh, at the database and, and see what's happening there. If the supervisor is interested, then the supervisor will contact you and say, can we chat? or can we Skype, or if you're in the immediate vicinity, they may even organize a, um, a meeting on site. Uh, and effectively, if they uh, agree to take you on, then they just uh, send us an email saying, I'm gonna take on student X. Um, there is a letter of understanding that needs to be completed that outlines a variety of different expectations, including, uh, stipend support which we'll get at shortly and then once that's completed um, you have to approve that the supervisor approves that sends it to us we then send it to mcgill enrollment services and boom um, mcgill will send you the official letter of, of, of acceptance um, so that's what to expect after your application there's another point to add as well. Um, there's no particular date by which we release our admission decision. So we, it's always a rolling basis. So the sooner you apply, maybe the sooner you may hear back from us. Um, there, obviously, during peak periods, it's hard for us to release admission decisions uh, as soon as possible. So there's no particular date by which you'll hear back from us. It's mostly a waiting game. Uh, if you haven't found a supervisor, when you're submitting your online application form, obviously that's your next step. If you've already found a supervisor, then you simply just wait to hear back from us. Okay, so, uh, stipend. Um, so if you do get admitted, okay, <clears throat> then every graduate student will receive a stipend. Okay. And that stipend is to put towards, <coughs> <coughs> put towards your tuition fees if there are any, and also towards your living expenses. This is the current uh, amount that is guaranteed for the different levels of um, students by the different categories. So whether you're, not, uh, whether you're a Quebec uh, resident, whether or not you're a Canadian citizen, but from outside of the province, or whether or not you're an international uh, student. So effectively, you'll notice uh, for international uh, students, the stipend uh, funding is for the first year is about thirty thousand uh, dollars. For the second year, it's about twenty-seven, and then on year three, it goes down to seventeen five. Uh, whereas for international PhD students, uh, it's twenty thousand per year. Okay. Now you might ask, why is there this shift? For international students, um, there is a the Quebec government uh, enforces a. a um, international tuition fee on international students and effectively um, both MSA and PhD students the IPN will cover the differential fees for PhD students but we cannot cover that for MSC students so that $29,875,000 most of that or much of that is going to go towards paying off your uh, tuition fees that being said, all of the stipend here, uh, stipend amounts here, are calculated such that uh, once you've paid for all your tuition fees, you will have roughly around fourteen thousand dollars to take home to support your living expenses. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, and I agree that it's not, particularly compared to some other places in Canada or in the states where you could pursue graduate funding. The beauty of Montreal is that our cost of living is relatively inexpensive. So compared to other Canadian cities like Toronto and Vancouver, for example, um, our rental rates are much lower, although they tend to be going up as well, but not as much. <coughs> our cost of living is lower, et cetera, et cetera. So we have calculated that, um, you know, 14,000, is sufficient for most students to live, I won't necessarily say high on the hog, but comfortably so that um, you know, they can get a decent place to live in uh, and they're able to afford their food. And in fact, they're able um, at least once a year to sort of 
take some time off to go back and visit families or take a vacation in some far off distant wonderful place to uh, get outside although uh, you probably don't want to leave Montreal in the summertime because that's the best time to be in Montreal okay um, so that explains the stipend funding now um, just one other point I want to make here uh, if you are a citizen of France or I believe Belgium okay yeah I'm not I should probably shouldn't uh, maybe Belgium you are considered to be a Quebec student. So your stipend will be uh, what's indicated um, in the Quebec student category. Okay. Um, okay, I'm gonna very quickly go over funding awards because I don't think that this is particularly relevant to um, most of you who are uh, listening to this right now um, because the external funding here, uh, so the NSERC, the, uh, uh, CGSM awards um, are really for Canadian um, citizens and therefore are not <coughs> are not um, uh, applicable for international students. Um, there's a little bit of a mix up here. Um, the Tomlinson doctoral fellowships um, are actually not external funding awards. They're internal McGill awards and they are open to uh, international um, citizens, although you do not apply for those. What happens is when you get recruited, we will look at our list of current recruits and we'll say, oh, these X number of people are really, really good, and then we will send your application to uh, the McGill uh, authorities who deal with the Tomlinson, and if you get it, that's great. Uh, if you don't, then that's it. So, But the point I'm trying to make here is that there's nothing you need to do uh, in order to apply for a Tomlinson. Okay. Now, there are international um, awards that you can apply for. <coughs> I would encourage you to visit the website that is at the bottom of this slide in order to see what all of the options are because there are uh, a fair number of them now. Yeah, for, for different countries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so I know in Mexico, there's been a major increase in terms of their funding of. Uh, students coming to study with us. Uh, China is going that way as well. Um, so you, you want to check that so that you can sort of see how the currently available funding matches up with your situation. Okay. Um, we do have internal funding as well. So the Faculty of Medicine at here at McGill um, offers fellowships, um, which you will apply for. You won't be able to apply for them now, but you can apply for them once you are in the program. Uh, the IPN itself also has some internal awards, which again, <coughs> you can't apply for now, um, but you um, would be eligible uh, to apply for those once you're here. Um, there are a variety of different uh, external foundations that you can apply to, and I believe they're open to uh, international citizens as well. Uh, so, for example, we have a foundation here called the Savoy Foundation that funds research in epilepsy and fellowships in epilepsy. Uh, there are a number of others. There's Alzheimer's um, foundations. It, it runs the gamut of disorders. Um, so, again, and that would be on, on the website um, that I just alluded to previously. <coughs> we also have travel awards. So, the IPN has what we call a great award which funds uh, travel to a uh, conference. It's a $500 award. It won't fund the whole thing, but it, it may allow you to stay <laughs> at a better hotel uh, relative to what you otherwise could afford. Uh, and we also have something called the Graduate Mobility Award, which funds sort of um, anywhere between one to four months, or I think it's six months, um, sort of uh, I don't want to say internships, but visits to a different lab that will sort of has a technique or where you're going to learn or do some research that's related to your IPN research, but in a different lab because that lab might have a different technique or a different way of approaching it. <clears throat> you would apply for that. You would say, okay, I want to go visit this lab. You get the lab's approval. You send us how much it's going to cost you. And then effectively, we have been fortunate enough in the past to really fund about 80% of the cost, okay? 
up to a certain amount. But the, so we just have that available. But again, you have to be here first before you can apply for either of those. Um, you can have a look here at uh, this particular table if you want. I think you probably stole this from the, the GPS website. Um, so it might save you a bit of a, a trip there, but you can see what all the different possibilities are um, and how that might fit with your particular situation. Okay. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip over that. And so um, <clears throat> a number of people ask us, going, okay, what is a, a degree in the IPN going to allow me to do um, once I get out of, once I complete the, the, um, the requirement? So effectively, the Bisha has again prepared this um, uh, nice little um, pie chart showing that our graduates, most of our graduates, the great majority, will go on to sort of academic careers, um, either, and by academic, I don't necessarily mean uh, professorships immediately, but they will go on to sort of do a postdoc and then hopefully get a professorship. 40% do that. Uh, about 20% just sort of decide that they wanna go into other professional studies, so they go into uh, to become MDs or dentists or pharmacists. 30% uh, will join the private sector, either in pharmaceutical industry, biotech, um, entrepreneurship, developing their own, um, their own companies. Or um, what a, lot, uh, a, a few of our current graduates are doing is that they're really um, getting into sort of um, consulting, if you will, uh, fields uh, that will help uh, politicians and other policymakers to sort of develop new programs or uh, policies with respect to uh, different aspects related to uh, mental health or, um, or um, you know, neurological disorders. And then last but not least, we have 50% who go into the government. So again, our healthcare administration, support staff, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, you, your, your options here are not necessarily limited to um, to uh, becoming an academic if that's not what you're interested in or if you're looking at this going, oh, you know, uh, the job market in academia is so, uh, is shrinking so, uh, so much these days that it's almost impossible to get an, an academic appointment. Uh, there are other opportunities for you. And in fact, I, I should mention that both in the IPN and McGill as a whole, uh, we have been trying to develop sort of additional support mechanisms that will uh, allow you to pursue um, or at least be made aware of other sort of career paths uh, other than academia. Okay, okay. so I guess I pass that to you. <coughs> Pardon me. So we focus a lot on the academic components of the IPN, but it's important to note that we also emphasize uh, student life and basically building up our students' professional experience, personal development, et cetera, and kind of putting them beyond the lab and beyond the classroom. So we organize a lot of events throughout the year, including lectures, seminars, workshops. We collaborate with other departments here at McGill so that our students can attend these events and be up to date on current and emerging topics in neuroscience. Particularly, one of our biggest events of the year is our scientific retreat, which happens every September. It's a two-day event during which our students present their posters and we invite a really well-known neuroscientist, either nationally or internationally, where they can talk about their research. And we also, as part of the event, we also have a student social, a wine and cheese evening, et cetera, during which our students and our attendees, they can get to mingle with one another, network with one another, and make connections as well. We also have an orientation for all of our new students. We have an open house week. We have the Grafstein lecture, which is basically a named lecture, which we invite uh, well-established neuroscientists to talk about their research and followed by a reception afterwards. So we really do put a, uh, an emphasis and importance on the social side of our student life as well. 
Um, and now our current students, members of our Graduate Students Association for Neuroscience, they'll talk about our student groups and the activities that they do as well. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Neelima and uh, I'm the president of the Graduate Student Association for Neuroscience. Um, and we have Jimin, who is also a uh, new and international student officer at uh, GSAN, uh, Graduate Student Association for Neuroscience. So uh, within GSAN, so GSAN is a very active um, the student organization um, and one of the largest student groups at McGill. Uh, and we have various uh, resources uh, offered by, so it's run by IPN students for IPN students. Um, and we have various resources and uh, social and academic events for students to get together and uh, network and also, um, you know, through workshops, learn new skills. Some resources that I want to highlight and then on, over to Jim and she'll highlight some other resources. Um, so there's one a very important resource we offer, which is peer support. So uh, this is a so resource where IPN students are trained in active listening and um, they're connect, they're matched with other fellow students who are in need of support. Um, it's a confidential, non-judgmental listening service. Another way we reach out to uh, students uh, in the program in need of support is through group discussions about various topics that hit home in grad school, such as homesickness and loneliness in grad school, uh, maintaining a work-life balance, um, imposter syndrome, um, and, uh, and also managing a lot of uh, various challenges in academia. And then um, we also have a neuroblog where uh, students uh, contribute, write various articles. We have a wrap on grad life and um, parenting in grad school and various other topics. Um, some academic events we have include uh, the three minute thesis competition, which is uh, explaining your thesis to a lay audience in three minutes. Um, we have certain workshops, uh, MATLAB and uh, programming, and um, we also have uh, social events where we go for hikes. We went for, for a kayak, we had a kayaking event this summer. Um, we have some other social events, uh, large and small scale social events. And if you're new to Montreal, and if you just want to uh, learn a new language, we also offer language classes for free. Um, you know, Montreal is a, it's a great opportunity to learn how to speak French and also practice your French. Um, and we also offer Spanish um, as a language um, you could learn. Mm. And then I think, and more recently, we've, we're also um, discussing how sustainable living. So we have info sessions on sustainable living. And since we work in labs, how to um, be more sustainable in and outside the lab. Um, so Jimin will, will emphasize more on some of the resources for international students. Thank you, Mayla. So hi, everyone. My name is Jimin. I'm a second year master's student in IPN. I'm also this year's GSAN New and International Student Officer. And as a member of GSAN, we make sure to create fun, inclusive, and informative events for the IPN community, including new and current students. So talking a little bit about Montreal, so based on the 2019 ranking of QC Best student cities, which takes into account of uh, university rankings, student mix, quality of living, employee activity, and affordability. Montreal is ranked as number one city in Canada and North America, while being ranked as number six internationally. And also we have one of the lowest rents and costs of living, which is quite important for students. And the beauty of Montreal is that we are bilingual. So uh, we do offer a lot of free resources within McGill and also outside of McGill to improve your French skills. And during your free time, you can also go on a hunt for active local music and art scenes, which are literally all over the all over uh, Montreal. And last night, but not least, Montreal is known to be a festive city, so we do have more than 100 festivals devoted to music, comedy, 
food and fashion. And these festivals go from summer, summer to winter. So even in the cold weather, you have a good excuse to go outside and explore the city. And to name a few that's coming up for the winter specifically, we have Igloo Fest, Montreal Snow Festival, Montreal Arrivière International Festival, Festival of Films on Art, also known as PIFA, and we have Poutine Week in February that's coming up if you never tasted poutine. So this is just the name of a few festivals. Um, also uh, going on to talk about McGill. So McGill University is located at the heart of Montreal in the downtown area. We also have another campus uh, further away uh, called McDonald. Our research institutes are somewhat spread around, um, some closer to the downtown campus, some within the down campus, downtown campus, or, or some other institutes that's a little bit further away, but within uh, uh, you can go easily by bus or metro, and they're usually like 30, min 30 minutes away. And a little info about our own students, McGill students have the highest average entering grades in Canada. They have won more national and international awards than their peers at any other Canadian university. 30% of our students are international, which is way above the, the national average of 17. 10% of our students are PhD students. And again, uh, it's above the national average of 6.5. So um, we do have a pretty dynamic student community and uh, our students come uh, from across the world. So if you're an international student, this is an important link to remember. You can take a screenshot or you can take a picture of this, or you can go to Google and write down McGill International Students and you can, you can easily find the link to this. But this link is um, basically dedicated for our international students and the website provides valuable information on upcoming webinars, customs, immigration documents, health insurance and spouse support, and it also includes uh, contact information for our international student advising within McGill. And as per GSEN, we have several events for international students. So for instance, we have the buddy program where um, I will be matching you with the current students and you can easily uh, ask questions to them regarding the graduate student, how to, about Montreal, uh, about McGill University. So there's that. In September um, 2019, we have the campus tour photo scavenger event for, for our new and uh, current students. In December, we had a discussion on winter blues. We understand that during this cold season, you might feel down, you, you're not motivated to go to your lab or you're not motivated to go outside to explore the city. So we do understand that. And we had a discussion about that and also we watched a fun movie afterwards. In February, we have this workshop called Not According to Fun. So basically, we understand that during the grad school, um, there might be some difficulties that you're gonna face, such as you, you have to um, suddenly take some time off, you're having a child, you're failing your candidacy, your class, and you don't know what to do. We have a workshop for that. And um, last but not least, in March, we have a workshop, uh, especially for international students regarding funding. So we do help you out uh, to find out which funding applications you can uh, apply for. So uh, there are different workshops. Uh, we are there as a GSEN group uh, to support you, support new and current students. You don't have to worry about that. And if you become a student within the IPN, um, you don't have to worry about uh, about uh, feeling behind. We have newsletters and events posted uh, actively on Facebook, so you will have access to all this important information, so you're not going to uh, miss any, so you don't have to worry about that. So that's all for me. We're going to move on to our Q&A session, which is a little... Oh, I just wanted to add uh, two more things. Yes. Uh, one is, apart from GSAN, we have BrainReach, which is a very... Uh, it's if you want to get involved, GSAN is one way of getting involved, but another way is Brain Reach, where students in the IPN um, teach, volunteer and teach uh, kids in fourth grade and uh, ninth grade um, about the brain, and it's really exciting. It's a nice way to get out of your research bubble and uh, build up on your communication skills, teaching skills. Um, and also uh, PGSS, the Postgraduate Student Society, is a central a student society uh, reaching out to all postgraduate students. They organize various events. So if, you're, if you feel like you don't want to 
actively be a member of GSAN or BrainReach, um, you can always um, participate in these activities and it's really good for your mental health as well. Thanks. <laughs> We're going to uh, move on to the Q&A session. I believe you can tweet us your questions or there's the chat going on. So thank you all for listening thus far. We're going to go on to the Q&A segment. Um, so the first question we'll start off with is co-supervision. How does that work and if it alters admission, funding, et cetera? The answer to that is no. Uh, it complicates things a bit, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will um, it will deny you uh, admission. Uh, so effectively, what you would need to do in that case is just to <coughs> get two supervisors who agree to sort of take you on in terms of probably a collaborative or mutual project, and that they both agree to do that. Then they would have to decide um, who's going to pay for what in terms of your stipend. And then once that's done, um, then effectively all you need to do is to fill out a letter of understanding uh, that includes both your supervisors and um, all the information and you agree to it and poof, you're in. How is the ICANN supporting students in their career development? As we tried to allude to, um, we, um, we are really sensitive to the fact that you know academic careers are um, becoming more and more difficult to obtain uh, and so we're actively always exploring ways in which we could help students uh, explore alternative career pathways whether that's in private industry or other governmental um, areas so um, uh, McGill's got a program uh, called MyTax for example that will fund a particular internship uh, for students to spend up to, I believe it's a year in a, um, in a company, a private company that is uh, research oriented, um, where you can go in and uh, work and get some experience and so get experience in terms of private practice. Um, every year at our retreat, we have a, um, what we call the uh, non-academic career panel, which is a, a a symposium where we invite only IPN students and, and graduates who have gone on to careers um, outside of academia to come in and uh, tell us what they've done, how they got there, what the advantages and disadvantages are. Uh, McGill also through um, uh, a program called, the, or an office called Skill Sets has a number of workshops that they offer uh, in uh, along those lines. And the last thing I want to mention is that uh, we, in the last year, <coughs> we have actually sort of developed, I don't want to call it a new wing or branch, but a sort of uh, career path that is specifically designed to sort of help you build um, your expertise with respect to uh, private industry and learning the business side of a research-oriented private company career. Uh, so those are all things that if you're interested in pursuing, um, just have to come and talk to us and we'll put you onto the right track and tell you who to go see and who to go talk to and um, you can move on from there. So yeah, we organize a lot of career panels at our events, which basically allow you to be aware of careers outside of academia. So we definitely do um, help you and uh, your career choices, career development, and there are a lot of resources that may go that can help you out with that as well. Um, so already we got a few questions regarding conversion of your CGPA to McGill standard. So we don't, there, McGill uses algorithms to be able to figure that out. We don't really know what goes into con that conversion. So that's a really difficult question to answer, but rest assured that we do accurately do that conversion. McGill does that. Um, do, do we offer partnerships with research institutes worldwide? 
The short answer is yes, uh, we do. Uh, so there's a, an office here at McGill called Brain at McGill, which has actually set up some um, partnerships with, I believe, Oxford, uh, at Zurich, and also a couple of universities in Israel. Um, and in fact, they have um, also got some sort of um, financial uh, support in order to allow that to um, be more easily realized. And so those are the four that come to mind. Um, there are, of course, there is the MyTax program that I mentioned, which is more so, it's not university uh, oriented, but it is, uh, it's more organizational, um, which you would be eligible to apply for. Um, anything else you can think of? A lot of our awards, so for example, the GREAT Award, it allows you to go abroad and build connections with these uh, different institutes and whatnot. So that's an indirect way of supporting you guys with building links across overseas. That's, that's not really a partnership though. It, it's that's more, true. Yeah. it's something that you can set up on an individual basis. Okay. So very often the, the great applications that I've seen recently are, um, you know, a supervisor is doing this particular thing, but somebody in a different place has a particular, so Professor here at McGill is interested in protein X, a uh, professor in Zurich has come up with a novel way of identifying protein X or has identified an interaction with protein X that is particularly of interest, that student and the supervisor here at McGill are interested in sort of pursuing that. We will find money in order to send you to that lab, assuming that lab in Zurich is interested. And we use Zurich as an example, anywhere in the world, um, to go and um, and, and train for a particular amount of time in that lab to pick up that technique or to follow up on some experiments that both labs would be interested in, uh, in conducting uh, collaboratively. Um, the next question, regarding the topic of your thesis, how would the topic be decided? Would the PI normally give the topic to the grad student? If you're a master's student, the answer to that is probably yes. So effectively, the student will come in and the uh, supervisor will say, okay, look, I've got this project here. Um, it's either ongoing or I will need to get it started. I'm thinking of putting you onto that. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to agree to that particular project. You may say, eh, it's not really something that gets my goat. Might there be some other thing that you can put me on? And then you can negotiate with your supervisor. That in part is what the letter of understanding is there for. So that your supervisor and you can sort of figure out something that you're both comfortable working on in terms of the project. For a PhD, again, um, you probably have a little bit more liberty in terms of picking a project. Um, again, it has to be within the context of, um, you know, what the lab is doing. So, you know, if you came into my lab and said, I want to do a, I, I want to do a project looking at this particular protein, in this particular pathway, in this particular area of the brain, I would look at you and go, no, because that's not what I do, right? Um, it, it really depends on um, what, so, and again, it's supervisor style. Some supervisors will come in and say, okay, look, here's the general question that I'd like you to sort of deal with, but in terms of exactly what you're gonna focus on, that's up to you. And I want you to sort of come back to me with a proposal saying, this is what I'm going to tackle, and this is how I'm going to plan to tackle it. Other, other supervisors will come in and say, look, here's a particular project. Um, this is what you, know, you should be doing in order to tackle it. But you still have a little bit of flexibility in there to sort of make it your own and add your own two cents if, if that's what the case is. So the short answer to that question is, it depends. Okay. Um, Generally speaking, you will be given some guidance in terms of focusing, <coughs> excuse me, what your project's going to be, but there's still going to be some leeway in there to sort of make it your own if that's something that you're really uh, excited to do. And, and sometimes supervisors will come back to us and say, you know, this student isn't working out in my lab because, um, 
You know, they want me to tell them exactly what it is to do, right? And that's not what a PhD is for, right? A PhD is there to develop your own sort of independent ability to sort of solve a solution. I'm happy to advise, but I'm not going to tell them, do this, use this particular technique to answer this particular question because it's an important question. I want this to come back and, and tell me this. Um, I was just reviewing a grant from uh, somebody from a, a, another university outside of Canada who I know um, professionally, um, who has sort of developed a new technology in his lab. He's a behavioral neuroscientist as well, but he's now developed the ability to do some optogenetic work. Uh, and he describes how that happens. He said, it's very, very fascinating. He says, I had a student come to see me <laughs> and say, hey, why don't we set up optogenetics in the lab? And he said, I told the student, I said, sure, I'm willing to do that. But before I do that, I want you to go out and tell me what optogenetics can do to answer the questions that we want to answer in the lab. And until he was able to do that, he wouldn't support it. But the student came back and said, look, we can use it to answer this question, this question, this question. He was absolutely. And so now they've got it all set up. And he's just submitted a grant to support that. And I'm an evaluator on there. I'm going to tell people, you know, fund this. This is phenomenal, but phenomenal from all aspects that I can think of. Um, another question regarding uh, admissions. Prereqs of courses for science related for applicants coming from computer science. I mean, if you've already taken, let's say, courses in physiology or biology during your undergrad, chances are that the rule of thumb is we want you to succeed in our core courses. So that's why we require you to have a science background. So if you've taken some biology courses during your undergrad studies, maybe you can go over the syllabi or uh, PN1 and PN2 and verify if you can pass those courses. And if yes, then you should be fine. Yeah, I, I would agree. So, um, it's because there are a number of cogs that were turning in my head because there are a number of <coughs> different considerations here. But we do have a bioengineering, a strong sort of neuroengineering or bioengineering um, a group uh, in the IPN. And, um, you know, a lot of that has to do with sort of programming software for X, Y, or Z purposes. Um, now, that being said, we will admit people, but it, it really is a question of if, you, if you've got no background in biology, it's going to be very difficult for you. Because as Tabisha alluded to, you're going to have to take our core courses. And our core courses really are, you know, you have to know what a neuron is and what a cell is and what DNA is and what proteins are for and how proteins are made in order to do well in those courses. Um, and it'll be a very, it, 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 if you don't have that knowledge already, you've got a lot of stuff to catch up on uh, immediately. And so you, it's going to be very challenging for you to, um, to, um, to, to succeed in those courses. Now, it's not impossible, okay? um, but um, it is there. So, you know, my graduate students, <coughs> typically when they come in, um, come in with a background in systems neuroscience. Um, they have to take PN1, molecular and cellular neuroscience. And usually what I tell them is, you're gonna take it in your first semester here, and if I don't see you in the lab for that first semester, that's fine with me because I need you to really pay the amount of attention that you know you're going to need in order to do well in PN1 um, because it is a very challenging course if you don't have a strong background. So I, I guess that's the best that we can do in terms of background. If you're coming in and, and you don't have any background, um, in, in neuroscience, it doesn't necessarily mean you won't be put into our database, but it may mean that you may have a significant problem uh, with respect to um, recruiting a supervisor. 
uh, because they might look at this and go, well, you know, this person's a great programmer uh, and has shown that, but effectively, if they don't know how to sort of program in the context of, of neuroscience or life sciences, th that might not be the best possible fit. Um, we have, we have um, a very, very influential um, fellow here at the MNI by the name of Alan Evans, who does a lot of this computational neuroscience. And he's got uh, postdocs um, who are both trained in neuroscience and others who are trained in computer science. And he says his biggest challenge is to be able to get the neuroscientists to use the same language as the computational folks and the computational folks to understand the language that's used by the neuroscientists. Not impossible to do, but it's a challenge. Um, next question, how are applications reviewed if someone applies to both the MSc and PhD? Or let's say someone applies to the PhD, um, do they have to submit a separate application for the MSc? Um, Question. She wants more for that. Um, okay, so if you're coming in as an undergraduate student uh, with an undergraduate degree, you are eligible to apply directly to the PhD program. Okay, in that case, we would, if you are admitted, you would be admitted as what we refer to as a PhD one student, i.e., someone who is coming in as a PhD student who doesn't have uh, a master's degree. We do on occasion admit those kinds of students, but those students need to be absolutely outstanding students. So they need to have a near perfect 4.0 uh, A plus um, CGPA and extensive research, prior research experience, including productivity. And by productivity here, I do mean you know, a publication or two. Not necessarily as first author, but <clears throat> on a publication. If that's the case, then we will admit as a PhD one student. Okay. So you can apply directly to the PhD. If in fact you apply directly to the PhD, but we feel that your qualifications are not eligible or are not sufficient to be admitted directly into the PhD, then we will consider your application as a master's students for master's entry. So we may say, no, we can't take you in as a doctoral student, but we can and we'd be happy to take you in as an MSc student because you do have a lot of potential. We like your application. It's just we don't think it's quite where it needs to be in order to come in directly as a PhD. Okay. Now, the other thing we should mention along those lines is we also have as a master's uh, option what we call the fast track. So usually in the master's program, um, after about a year to 18 months, if your master's project has been successful and you've made sufficient then you can then you can effectively apply to a fast track, which means you hold um, a candidacy exam in which you're going to say, I'd like to go into the PhD. This is what I've done as an MSc student. This is how I'm going to carry on the project uh, as a PhD student. And if you pass that, then you're automatically into the PhD. So usually that occurs after the first year to 18 months, right? The advantage of that is that you do not need to write an MSc thesis. Okay? And so that saves you anywhere from uh, six months to a year, okay? In terms of your overall uh, graduate career. So if you do apply as a PhD student, but you don't get in, and, but you do get in as a master's student, you can still sort of fast track to the PhD. Um, another question. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of questions about, let's say, international students um, moving here with your family or spousal support. We rarely deal with issues like that. I would encourage you to consult the International Student Services of McGill University. Um, so basically, here's the important slide with all of the links related to all of the topics that we've discussed thus far. And the last link is that of the ISS, the International Student Services. So please take a photo of this slide and use it to your advantage. Um, another question. Oops. 
spouses to learn. Yeah. But do you want to mention something about the warrant? Uh, your parents and your so we have a new article that someone had done a lot of research and uh, published it on our neuroblog with uh, uh, they did a lot of research and there's a lot of resources uh, if you're a parent and a grad student so you might want to check that out as well it's the gsan neuroblog uh, um Okay, so say the question. Okay, so a question that we got was um, apparently, I don't know the exact tuition fee rates for international students for PhD, but on McGill's website, it mentions it. And one of the questions that we got was it's about $19,000 and our stipend funding table showed that PhDs get $20,000 stipend funding. So that obviously leaves very little room to cover your living expenses and whatnot. So how does that work? I kind of alluded to when we looked at the stipend. If you're an international... <coughs> Excuse me. If you're an international PhD student, okay, it's true that tuition fees will be approximately eighteen to nineteen thousand dollars when you come in. The IPN will cover the international component of that, so that effectively, which comes out to about fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars, we pay that off for you. So effectively, what you're going to be paying as a as a student is just what a Quebec student would be paying, which is anywhere between four to five thousand dollars currently so that's where that comes in for international master's degrees we don't do that because we just don't have sufficient funds in order to do that we'd love to be able to do that but we can't unfortunately our bank account is is is, is, is I, I can't complain about the investments that we get from mcgill in our in our bank account but it's not infinite um so we can't do that. So what we do effectively is we can put $3,000 towards the tuition fees, which we do. And then that's why the tuition fees are uh, 29, uh, that the stipend fees are about $30,000 because effectively you will have to pay the balance of those fees. Um, and so that's the way that works. As we mentioned, this is an important slide with all of the links and feel free to connect with us on social media. We're active on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So you can be up to date with all of our uh, upcoming events or any kind of sessions that we may hold something similar to this. We also have an open house week, the week of February 10, where we will be having an information session here on campus and we'll be touring our supervisors labs as well as having a luncheon with an IPN graduate. So this is mainly for domestic um, applicants or students interested in the IPN. So if you're interested in our open house week, please feel free to email me, which is projects.ipn.mcgill.ca. And almost all the information that we've covered in this session can be found on our website, which is mcgill.ca slash IPN. I just want to mention is if you're a Canadian student from outside of the province and you would like to visit at McGill, send us an email because we do have a source of finance that could allow us to support you to come and visit. Yes. Okay. So, but you need to send us the email saying, I'd like to visit, da, 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 da. Um, here are the dates, et cetera, et cetera. Send that to us and then we'll look at your application and we'll say, okay, we think we can bring you in uh, and we can support you in that amount by this amount. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that for people outside of Canada. Yeah. I wish we could, but unfortunately, again, like I said, uh, our, our finances are not, uh, are not um, infinite. So. Okay, last thing I'd just like to say is if you have any other questions that you might have with respect to admissions, please do not email me. 
because I'm likely to give you the wrong answer. <laughs> uh, you, can in, you can email either Debisha, um, who would be at projects.ipn at mcgill.ca, or you could, uh, better yet, uh, email our admissions officer, uh, who is Mirko Sablish at uh, ipn.admissions at mcgill.ca. Or alternatively, if you have an active U apply application, there's an area in there where you can actually um, communicate with the admissions officer, ask a question, um, or check up on your application, use that as well. If you send it to me, I'm likely to either sort of lose it in my email uh, inbox, or alternatively send you the wrong information, or alternatively, um, sort of forward that to either Debisha or Mirko. Okay. Um, so that's what I would suggest. Okay. All right, um, in closing, I just wanna thank you all for um, being here with us today. Uh, and to, uh, I wanna thank Jamin and the and Alima, sorry. <laughs> I remember the name, it's A just my tongue names. got tied. <laughs> and Debisha, uh, and uh, we hope to hear from you again. Uh, sorry. Note. I have a uh, quick tips because um, I, as a student in IPM, went through all this application process. Don't hesitate to take time to work on your application, on your personal statement, CV. If you, if your university offers some uh, writing support, go through that. Um, for your supervisor, it's important that you also take time to get to know your potential supervisor, what your um, research interest is, because if you're a master's student, you're going to spend two to three years with your supervisor. If you're a PhD student or if you go through that fast track, you're going to spend about four to seven years within that lab. So I do encourage um, you students to take time to get to know, uh, go through that database and get to know, uh, go through the supervisor list and get to know what kind of research they do, because I think that's important. Um, otherwise, good luck and maybe you'll, we'll see you next year. <laughs> Great, thank you everyone.